A lot of people look to politicians and government agencies to steer the life of a nation and to preserve its freedoms, but I hope this series has shown that they don't really have the answer. Only the church has the answer, because only the church knows that the key to true freedom is Jesus Christ. Only he can stop us becoming enslaved to both legalism and license. John says, so if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so it falls upon us, the church, to tell people, to tell the world how to get free. Paul says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? In upcoming series then, we're going to be moving on to that next step of how we engage with our culture to tell them about Jesus. But just quickly, I want to give you a little bit of insight into where we're going with this ministry. And I'm going to talk to you for a moment about William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was a Christian politician who lived in England in the late 1700s and early 1800s. That was just after the Enlightenment and so Wilberforce's society looked a lot like ours in the sense that Christianity was starting to be stigmatized and shunned. Of course, that meant that the law of entropy was then taking over and immorality was starting to become rife. Brothels sprung up everywhere and indeed were quite fashionable for a while and that led to problems with paedophilia. Girls of 12 and 13 years old were being dragged into the system. System. Drunkenness was spiralling out of control too and this led to inner city violence and riots. Criminals carried out their deeds shamelessly in broad daylight and a 1796 study concluded that an eighth of all the citizens in London at that time were supporting themselves through illegal activity from prostitution to thieving to embezzlement to fraud. Now, as a Christian, Wilberforce knew that only God in the hearts of men and women could turn things round. He said, To the decline of religion and morality, our national difficulties must both directly and indirectly be chiefly ascribed. And my only solid hopes for the well-being of my country depend not so much on our fleets and armies, not so much on the wisdom of her rulers or the spirit of her people, as on the persuasion that she still contains many who love and obey the gospel of Christ, that their intercessions may yet prevail, that for the sake of these, heaven may still look upon us with an eye of favour. He also said, If a principle of true religion should gain ground, there is no estimating the effects on public morals and the consequent influence on our political welfare. Also, it is only by educating our people in Christian principles that we can advance in strength, greatness and happiness. Wilberforce further recognised that if Jesus Christ was the cure to society's ills, then the church were the ones responsible for administering that cure. We are his hands and feet after all. Therefore, he and his friends quickly got started on delivering that cure by identifying the main social problems of the age and then creating these small dedicated groups called societies to tackle them. These small groups were made up of people with complementary skills, passions and resources. They worked together on a wide variety of very specific goals that were of particular interest to those within the groups. For example, there was the Society for the Suppression of Vice, the Church Mission Society, the Proclamation Society, the Bible Society, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Small Debt Society, the Abolition Society, the Anti-Slavery Society, the Sunday School Society, the Bettering Society, and many more. Each of these small groups targeted a very specific social problem or were designed to spread the gospel in some new innovative way. And to that end, they wrote books, pamphlets, tracts, they campaigned, they lobbied and generally did anything necessary to get their message out. In fact, there's a scene in the biopic movie of Wilberforce's life that explains their strategy perfectly. We are talking about the truth. So we should hand it out to people. Drop it from church roofs, paint pictures of it, write songs about it, make bloody pies out of it. In other words, by any means possible, music, art, literature, design, it didn't matter. They just wanted to flood the world with truth, engage with and challenge culture by any means possible, and they used every gift, talent and resource available to them. Wilberforce himself wrote a book called Practical Christianity, challenging Christians of the day to turn their faith into action, stating that all Christians should use their time to find some ignorance to instruct, some wrong to redress, some want to supply, some misery to alleviate. He thought that people should put the law of Christ into effect by loving God and loving others in practical and positive ways. 
The group of people that collected around Wilberforce became known as the Clapham Sect. Some mockingly referred to the group as the Saints. The historian Stephen Tompkins describes the Clapham Sect as a network of friends and families in England with William Wilberforce as its centre of gravity, who were powerfully bound together by their shared moral and spiritual values, by their religious mission and social activism, by their love for each other and by marriage. William Haig says, The Saints were an informal community characterised by considerable intimacy as well as commitment to practical Christianity and in opposition to slavery. They developed a relaxed family atmosphere, wandering freely in and out of each other's homes and gardens and discussing the many religious, social and political topics that engaged them. What the Clapham sect did was establish one of the best examples of true Christian community that has been committed to history outside of the Book of Acts. And what they proved was that when the church applies the New Testament model, no matter what the era, it always changes the world. Sometimes we imagine the biblical church was just a one-off filled with super saints that we can never hope to replicate. But the Clapham sect did it, and they were hugely successful. Not only did they get slavery abolished throughout the entire British Empire, but they completely reformed the moral climate of the age. Tompkins says, The ethos of Clapham became the spirit of the age. Indeed, it is reckoned that their actions still echo in our society today. And it's why the Victorian titans that Boris Johnson wondered about were so generous with their money. This city is built on the, uh, very largely in the 19th century, on the euergotism, the generosity, the philanthropy of dynamic people who made colossal sums of money. And they built schools, and they went out and they founded hospitals and orphanages. And what makes me... They're not doing it they're now. They're not doing it now. And so the Fuel Project is essentially about recreating this New Testament model for the 21st century, replicating what the early church did and what the saints in the 19th century did. And the challenge for us is, what would that look like in this era? Well. What if we grouped ourselves into local church communities for a start and developed the same kind of loving, informal, familial atmosphere that the early church enjoyed? What if within these small groups we identified the issues of our era and within our communities and then developed creative ideas for bringing Jesus into those situations? What if these groups set real practical goals and then set about trying to achieve them together? What if every single person within these groups had the opportunity to use their own unique gifts and resources along the way? What if church no longer meant sitting passively in rows on a Sunday morning watching a show, but what if it meant a proactive group of society changers who challenge and confront the world around them? Margaret Mead famously said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. She's right. Just look at the 12 disciples. Just look at the Clapham sect. Here at the Fuel Project, we're already establishing a worldwide network of small groups with this aim in mind. If you'd like to be a part of that network, then just head to the website for details and you can sign up there. We're also going to build on this vision with subsequent books and series, so I hope you stick with us for that. And you can also learn more about them on the website too. If you'd like to partner with the Fuel Project financially, we greatly appreciate that as it takes a lot of time and resources to make these materials. And you can make donations through a button on the website or via PayPal to Authentic Fuel at gmail.com. Your prayers are also greatly appreciated. In fact, that is the most powerful thing that you can actually do if you want to help. At the time of making this series, literally hundreds of people have now written to say they became a Christian as a direct result of the Fuel Project. But the vision is for thousands or hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions. And I hope that you'll be inspired to play an active role in that. Because this ministry at its best won't be a top-down thing. In fact, it's not designed to be a top-down thing. It's increasingly designed to be a grassroots movement of different groups all around the world, leaders rising up in different churches across the world who are willing to take a hold of this vision, form small groups, join the network, and then be proactive with their faith. That's how we reach the world, by disciples, making disciples, making disciples. And then on that same track, we are available on all forms of social media, so please do stay in touch and add and subscribe and do all that kind of stuff. And uh, please do also use the Fuel Project Network and stay in contact with each other and share ideas. That about wraps it up for this series, but I will see you on the next one. And in the meantime, please do remember to stay free and don't get tied up in slavery to either sin or the law.